Church, good morning. Uh, we're going to be in Psalm 109 this morning, so uh, if you need a little head start to get there, uh, it comes after 108, just before 110, so right in that, right in that area. Uh, thank you for your prayers for me, my, fa- my wife, as we have been able to minister to our Sozo staff and extended uh, friends and family. Uh, Ten days ago, one of our baristas was tragically killed in, a, in an accident, and um, 21 years of age. Uh, he had been with us for about three years and uh, knew, knew his family. And good news is he knew Jesus. They know Jesus. And I met with the family this past week. We had the memorial yesterday. Uh, but last Monday, met with him here at Sozo. Mom comes in just wailing because this is a place where her son worked. He performed. Uh, met with the family. The, the, the great part about working with a family who knows Jesus is they give you the green light to say, share, share the gospel, right? Uh, God, don't waste this tragedy and uh, use it as a means to not only honor Andrew's life, but use it as a way to somehow display the, the good news of Jesus. And so you guys prayed, and yesterday we had his service, and God was, God was working, and lots of people crying, lots of young people that knew Andrew who don't know Jesus. Uh, there are those who mourn without hope. And they are looking for things to try to fill that, that vacancy in their hearts. And the message is only Jesus can fit that hole. And, and even give us purpose and meaning for our, our, our lives. So thank you for your prayers. And I, and I have something I want to share from that. So after the memorial, there's a reception outside. And a um, guy introduced himself, didn't know him. He says, I want you to know how Andrew brought me closer to Jesus. And I was like, oh, this will be interesting. He says, I come to the coffee house on uh, Tuesdays. We open an hour early for this men's group from another church. And I only do it because I want to make money. And so... um, so I said, hey, win-win. You fill my coffers, we'll fill your soul. So the men come uh, on Tuesday morning, 6 a.m., and Andrew was the guy every Tuesday opened up the shop early for them. And this guy said, if Andrew did not open the shop for us, I would not be a part of this group, which this group has used me to come closer to Jesus. And I sit there and go, that's awesome. A small act of opening a door can have an eternal impact on someone's soul. Don't, don't dismiss the little things, right? First service, I had a woman share with me a, a, a cool uh, message. She has some friends, uh, uh, a guy she knows, lost his job, big company, after 20 plus years. And he has just been devastated over this, and he's been just trying to hit the, hit the pavement, get back into the workforce. And he was, uh, he was on his third interview with a job that took him from another state, that would potentially take him from another state. And he posts on, he posts on Facebook how he met an Uber driver who took him from the airport to this third interview. Uber driver's a believer. He's a believer. They make a connection, and they stop at this place, and the Uber driver says, let me pray for you. And they pray right there in the car for one another. He says, whether, whether I get the job or not, the fact that there would be someone else that would be able to stop and pray for me. Uh, can God use Uber drivers? You better believe it. Can God use a barista to open the door for a shop? To, you better believe it, right? So stop being the people that look for God to do the big things, right? We all want the Red Sea to part in our lives. Amen, right? We're all there. Don't dismiss the little things that we are surrounded by continually where God makes his hand of mercy evident. Don't miss those little occasions to be kind and to show goodness to people because you never know how your small act will win someone over and move them perhaps closer to Jesus. Amen? So that's good. So, all right, uh, Psalm 109, let me pray as we navigate a very difficult psalm, and you're going to hear why this is difficult in a moment. Father, we invite you now to uh, come to us, be with us, uh, teach us, engage our hearts and our minds, open our eyes to uh, the the beauty of what lies before us, help us navigate the difficult sections in all. Lord, not only be glorified, but, but bring a word to us, because what we are talking about is so relevant to our, our, our day-to-day living. Lord, thank you for being the God who loves us, who delivers, who heals, uh, to you be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Psalm 109 is where we're going to be. And um, 
I'm going to say a phrase and I want you to finish it. And everyone else, everyone in this room knows this phrase. I'll start. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but liars, liars, bad liar, liar, pants on fire, right? So here's the reality of it, right? We all know the phrase, sticks and stones may break our bones. And when we're kids, we kind of share it with pride, like what you say won't hurt me. But I tell you what, the more you get into your adult teen years, the more words do affect us. Right? We, we have all been the, um, we've all been the recipient of positive words and encouraging words. We've given positive and encouraging words. But it's a whole lot different a feeling when you're the recipient of negative words, malicious words, slanderous words, gossip, etc. Perhaps you've not only been on the receiving end, perhaps you've been the one who's, who's given malice you've given slander perhaps in response to what was given you you know kind of fight fire with fire kind of deal and we realize the older we get the more people say things about especially negative things it really does tear us up how a word not rightly spoken can linger on our souls for a long time and, I, and I'm going to say, and not just the words perhaps that might be hurtful from, a, from an enemy, you almost expect it to come from an enemy, but how about when it comes from a friend? How about when someone uh, slanders your reputation? What if someone um, impugns your character? What if someone is just nasty and, and perhaps some even here maybe have even had their lives threatened by someone that, that was an enemy? How, how do we, as followers of Jesus, conduct ourselves, especially in the presence of such hostility? Ladies and gentlemen, what I present to you this morning is that we are called to be countercultural, and, and what I'm going to impart to you today is something that the world doesn't understand. When, with the instructions I'm going to share with you that I've been processing this week, boy, to act like Jesus in the midst of such difficulty is a difficult task. The, the fact that we have people that would take advantage of us, people that would uh, accuse us falsely of things, um, abusive, unreasonable people, um, and, and to not match their fury and their ferocity with, with like kind, if not worse, we realize that this is a, this is a spiral that will, will destroy all of us if we don't change something. And so we come to Psalm 109, and, and I'm going to give you a big fancy word. This may be the biggest word I give you all morning, so let's just get it out of the, out of the way right here, right now. Psalm 109 is called an imprecatory psalm. Imprecatory. And you are sitting there going, Pastor Scott, what by chance does imprecatory mean? And th thank you for asking. Uh, let me tell you what imprecatory means, and let me phrase it in a way that may connect more with your heart than the, the big word imprecatory. Have you ever prayed, Lord, would you just please kill my enemy and destroy their lives? <laughs> Don't act all sanctified and holier than thou, like you only pray loving things to God, right? Let's be honest. Maybe you haven't been so severe to say, kill my enemy and destroy their lives. Maybe you've prayed, Lord, would you just ruin their lives a little bit? <laughs> Lord, would you, would you do something cataclysmic so that uh, you take the wind out of their sails, you would destroy their pride, that you would somehow take their ego and just dash it on the rocks. Has anyone ever prayed anything like that? Or am I, is it just me and I'm here for therapy today? The fact that we have all wrestled in our hearts with very true and honest emotions, especially when people want to destroy us, sometimes my default isn't always Spirit of Jesus, love them. Sometimes my default is, boy, God, this is tough and this is difficult and I want you to do something in them and, and it's not good. That's, that's called imprecatory. We do not pray the Psalms of, of imprecatory indiscriminately. They're, these are not intended for people who cut us off on the freeway. Okay? This is not intended for people who chew with their mouths open at the dinner table. And this is something that we frequently experience in my house. So I'm, I'm, I'm speaking personally here. This is not spoken about the person, the neighbor that launches fireworks in their backyard in the middle of the night. Amen. So this is having to do with the work of God in all of our lives, whether you're righteous or unrighteous. See, we come to Psalm 109 and we come to some very difficult words. These are, these are places in the Bible where the Lord 
has given to us because he cares about how we respond in the midst of adversity. Hostility. And these are not easy words. Even the great C.S. Lewis, you may have heard of him before, had a difficult time with the imprecatory psalms, all written by King David. Here was the Lord's anointed, a man after God's own heart, and yet he was being attacked by people maliciously, viciously. We need to wrestle with this. We need to look at these imprecatory psalms and And honestly go, Lord, what would you have us learn from these things? So being your pastor and loving you the way I I do, uh, I pick the toughest of the imprecatory psalms, all right? We're like, we're not going to play games today, Lord. We're going to pick the toughest one, the one that comes across the the worst. Let me just tell you, the psalm we're going to look at today contains 24 curses. I know. We're not even going to cover all 24. Matter of fact, I love you so much, we're not going to cover any of them. I'm just going to do a cursory glance of the curses. You like how I just played that right there? So here we go. Uh, We're not going to read it in its entirety, but what we want to do is I want to pick out the important points for us to learn and grow and walk away with, I think, important lessons God would have for us. How do we respond to people who treat us horribly how do we respond to people who want to slander our reputations our characters and as someone who has been personally through this experience before i would fail you if i didn't share with you my story i'm i'm like the poster boy of this right so uh here's here it is all lived out on full display in 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 pastor scott's life and so hopefully i can weave a little bit of my journey into this psalm 109 first point we need to consider is this the cry to hear And I love how the psalmist begins this very difficult chapter. The cry to hear. Notice verse 1. O God of my praise, do not be silent. For they have opened the wicked and deceitful mouth against me. They have spoken against me with a lying tongue. They have also surrounded me with words of hatred and fought against me without cause. In return for my love, they act as my accusers, but I am in prayer. Thus they have repaid me evil for good and hatred for my love. Let's stop right there. Two things that really jump out at me when I'm looking at this. First is there's a prayer in silence. There's this context in which David is crying out to the Lord, and obviously God is silent. Has God ever been silent with you? Yes. And I'll tell you what, it it can be disheartening, it can be discouraging, where you are responding in this occasion, and it doesn't seem like God is talking. Boy, the enemies are chatting, they're talking, you just don't hear the voice of God, it seems like he's silent. And all I know is that David in this moment does not allow his faith to waver. He says, God, even though you may not be speaking, I'm going to continue to speak. And therein lies a good lesson for all of us. You have to keep talking. You have to keep speaking. You have to keep praying. Even if you're not getting anything reciprocated at this moment, at this time, you've got to keep talking to him. You've got to keep your heart attached. You can't allow there to be this disconnect between you and him if for some reason he is withholding his voice momentarily. One thing I know about God, and I know a few things, but here's one thing, is that God will not stay silent forever. But there may be a a season, there may be a moment where I know you can't let off the accelerate pedal of you talking to him. So number one, keep speaking, keep talking, keep praying. And number two, that you and I can offer a prayer from suffering. You don't just go to God with your praises, you go to God with your pleas. Your, your petitions, the fact that you're calling out and crying out from a, a desperate place because here's, here's what makes the suffering all the worse for, for David is that he is not only in a situation that he can't control as far as what's being said about him, but he's trying to do good and not only have his good return with evil. He's, only to, he's trying to speak kindness only to have the, the response of, of, of evil spoken. Have you ever tried to do this? Have you ever tried to not, you know, put, you know feed fire with fire, but, but take the high road and be like Jesus? What do you do when it doesn't work out the way you're hoping it works out? 
How, I mean, when, when you reach the end of, of just saying, okay, I don't know what else to do. I'm trying to be kind and I'm trying to do good, but it's not coming back the same way. H- how do we manage this? Especially when, again, we keep all this intention with the New Testament where it says, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. If they're, if they're hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. See, what David's praying here and what the New Testament and Jesus teach seem to be at odds with each other. And, and, and I want to navigate that here with you because here's what I do know the New Testament teaches. And, and if you want to write these down, good luck keeping up. But here we go. We, we love our enemies by doing good to them. We love our enemies by providing food when they're hungry and water when they thirst. We love our enemies by blessing them when they persecute us and oppress us. We love them by responding to their mistreatment with prayer for their salvation. If, if, you, if you don't want to buy what I'm, I'm, I'm selling, look at uh, Romans chapter 12. Two passages that we, we're, we, you need to take this week and just, just saturate your heart with. This is, this is homework. We're going to sign homework today, okay? Meditate this week. Romans 12. Look what Paul says. Let your love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection, right? Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Does this sound like kind of what we're talking about? Yeah, contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality bless those who persecute you bless and do not curse them don't play the same game rejoice with those who rejoice weep with those who weep live in harmony with one another do not be haughty and then he continues and then we get into some more familiar territory where he says but associate with the lowly lowly never be wise in your own sight because when you try to act according to your own wisdom it ends up getting messier than it does cleaner right? This is not about your wisdom. This is about somehow God bringing wisdom to the situation. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends upon you, live peaceably with all people. Behold, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God who has said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Wow. There is a different way to live. There is a different spirit to embrace. We can break out of the cycle of the dog-eat-dog environments we have created. We fight fire with fire, and there is something different. Love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Someone once said, to return evil for evil is demonic. To return good for good is human. But to return good for evil is divine. And that's exactly what we need to learn. We need to adopt a mentality of, and we'll call it this, enemy love. Enemy dash love. Which if you show your enemy love, like what we just see, saw in, in Romans 12, two things are going to happen in that person's life. And, I, and I'm not going to throw a guarantee on this. I'm just going to say it's going to do two things. What they do with it is going gonna, is gonna to depend on where their hearts are at. But when you show enemy love, two things happen. You ready for this? Two words. You surprise them and you shame them. You surprise them because they are not used to someone responding to their vitriol, their hatred, their anger in a way Jesus would respond. And all of a sudden they're like, you surprise them. Secondly, you know what you do? You shame them. Because by taking the higher road, by being the better person, you sit there and you model what at a core level humanity should be like. We are not designed to destroy one another. We are designed to build one another up. And so what we need to understand is that we surprise them and shame them by our kindness. Because this is the gospel. Has not the kindness of God led us to repentance, according to Romans chapter 2? How many, how many times are you surprised by the love of God shown to you? How many times has the love of God shamed you with how much he loves you, right? So we're taking the same truth we claim to have embraced, and now we get to model it at a, at a somewhat imperfect human ex- experience. And so here we are. 
loving our enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And you're sitting here, and I know some of you are going, but Scott, you don't know my enemies. Right? I, I've got my enemies, and you're sitting there going, uh, you don't know my, my enemies. And this is where John Stott, great, great uh, Christian author, he says this. If the cruel torture of crucifixion could not silence our Lord's prayer for his enemies, what pain, what pride, what prejudice or sloth could justify the silencing of ours? He, we remember that Jesus is not separated from us when we're going through these moments, which perhaps makes our cry for God to hear us all the more important. He is not a God who's removed. He's not a God who doesn't care. He is a God who's very much involved. Which leads us to our second point, the cry to curse. Because what we have to realize is, starting in verse 6, the the psalmist shifts into curse mode. And, And it's a place maybe that we're familiar with. And through verse 20, he issues 24 curses that he wants to call down upon his enemy. Now, mind you, this is in the context of a song. The Psalms are songs, and I know we sing, Jesus is my boyfriend, fa la 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 la, but when was the last time you sang a song about cursing your enemies? I mean, it works easy with, Lord, I need you, la. It works a whole lot different with, Lord, please kill them, all my enemies. Right, you know what I'm saying? It doesn't, it doesn't really flow, right? Like people would walk in and go, that's a weird song, right? But this was a song that was sung among these people from the heart of David. And how, how do we wrestle with the language in verses 6 to 20? And I'm not going to read it all. But basically it starts and says, Lord, the people that accuse me, may you bring them to court and may their lawyer be worse than them. <laughs> right? Can you imagine that? Like, and we know, you know, we know they can be pretty bad people, right? Verses 6 and 7. He says, let, let the person that represents them be worse than them so they understand. Let them, give them a taste of their own medicine. And then he says, curse their lives, curse their families, curse. And so we sit there and read this and go, is this right? Is this, is this something that's in line with the heart of God? And there's two things I want us to think about. And I'm going to spare you because I love you from reading all the 24 curses. You can read them on your own later. But their first point is this. You need to avoid sinful personal vengeance. Okay? You need to avoid making this about you, your reputation, your circumstances. If you're living righteously, if you're living in a way that honors God, you're going to have your critics. And you can't be consumed with trying to silence them or change their tune. David is a man who's after God's own heart. And if there's any man in the Old Testament, perhaps David is the most least, he's the least vengeful man we have. Because he is a man who had a guy like Saul chasing him, wanting to kill him. And there were moments David could have killed him and he didn't. Think about the interaction with a woman named Abigail and her ornery husband Nabal. Think about David's own son, Absalom. All these opportunities where David could have played the same game and fought fire with fire, but he chose not to. If you ever want to read a really good book on this, a book called A Tale of Three Kings, subtitled A Study in Brokenness. And it is the story of David and how do you live a life when all people want to do is throw spears at you. All people want to do is destroy you. And this is a book that I have given away countless copies of. I have marked up like crazy. I think I'm probably on my 30th copy by now. Because I've been in a place where, boy, Lord, if, you, if, if your goal is breaking me, I, 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 I've learned, can I pass this test? Can I move on to the next class? Right? David is, is the perfect person to be able to share insights And he would just say to us, avoid sinful personal vengeance. Yet, how do we reconcile what I just said with what's listed here in Psalm 109? Let me just tell you right here. Never in the psalm does he say, say, God, show me how to get even with my enemies. Never in the psalm does he say, help me learn how to pay back my enemies for what they're giving to me. See, there's a difference, and this is an important point, church. There's a difference between vindication and vindictiveness. 
There is a difference between God, would you vindicate my cause, versus Lord, let me act out of vindictiveness. One has to do with the triumph of divine justice. The other has to do with some sort of satisfaction of personal malice. If you make this about you, you will not only not learn what God wants you to learn, you're going to destroy your soul. This is not about you. Did we not read that vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And if he said he will do it, he will do it. And let me guarantee you, he's going to do a much better job of it than we are. So if I am called to avoid sinful personal vengeance, we must then secondly know that then the converse is we are to anticipate perfect divine judgment. The good news is God knows. The good news is God is aware. The good news is God does keep a record. The good news is he has promised to not let the righteous suffer without some sort of payment to be, to be made, right? He is going to fight on our behalf. Why? Because we're his people. This is about his glory, and you better believe he's going to defend his cause. So Romans 12, Psalm 109 brings us to this place where David says, okay, I'm not going to take matters into my own hands, but there are these curses. And mind you, here is an important point to understand about the curses. The reason David can pray the way he prays is that these are not requests. This is details about a certain future. He's not requesting these things happen. He's merely saying if these people continue in their rebellion and their disobedience and act towards God's righteous the way they are, there is a certain future stored up for them. And you're sitting there going, wait, 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 what? Here it is. While a man or woman has their breath here on earth, there is always a chance for repentance to happen in their hearts. And you can love, and you can serve, and you can pray, and sometimes a person will continue to go about their vindictiveness and their hostility and their hatred, and there comes a point where you say, Lord, this is in your hands. I'm I'm trying to act in such a way where I'm showing good and I'm showing love, right? I want to surprise them. I want to shame them because the goal with acting that way is to transform their hearts. Weren't you a rebellious person at one point? Weren't you an obstinate person at one point? Weren't you a stubborn person at one point? And all of you can stand behind me because I was the most stubborn person there was. And yet God showed his love for me that while I was yet a sinner, while I was yet an enemy, while I was yet in my wickedness and my unrighteousness, Christ died for me. And because of God's kindness, it is his kindness that has led me to repentance. And so what we are praying for is exactly that. Lord, would you bring about some sort of repentance in their life? Because if they continue down the road without Jesus, this is what awaits them. He is not requesting, he's only making known the certainty of their future. There is still a call to repentance. There is still this desire to say, quit persisting in your rebellion and, 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 and come to God. But just realize that some may not, and the righteous will suffer, but the suffering will not be for eternity. There will be an end. And I will tell you this this morning, you guys, that the picture of judgment against the wicked is really a picture of how glorious God's righteousness is compared to our sinfulness as human beings. And that God has remedied this in the personal work of Jesus Christ and the offer of salvation through him. That we want, we don't want any to perish, but for all to come to eternal life but we realize that there will be some that will be set in their ways. And there is a future for them that as the psalmist in Psalm 109 says, not only will destroy them, it will destroy their families and the generations to follow. There is a curse that sin brings to every single person and only Jesus can reverse the curse. And so the judgment is appropriate response to God's justice to the actions of his enemies. And David is not wrong to pray this way. 
And let me give you a little side note. And it's the reason why Peter in Acts 1 cites Psalm 109 when it comes to replacing Judas as far as the disciples. You guys remember who Judas was? He was the one who betrayed the Lord. He was the one who was among the 12, who walked with Jesus, who saw Jesus perform the miracles, who heard Jesus teach. He was even the treasurer. And some of you are thinking like, why would they trust him with the money? Because he was a likable person. He wasn't the typical you know, caricature who you would think like, was Judas the guy that walked around constantly with a scowl on his face? Like little devil horns popping up out of his hair. Maybe he had a little devil tail. I don't know. But we think like, we think we know what Judas like, looked like. He fit in among the disciples perfectly. Yet his heart wasn't transformed by Christ. And he met a future, a certain future that is reminiscent of the curses found in 109. And this is why Peter quotes Psalm 109 because they had to fill a vacancy that that rebel, obstinate Judas left. And so Peter says, this is what has happened. He has continued in his rebellious ways. Which leads us to number three. There's a cry to deliver. Which is, and I'm going to say to you, church, this morning, it is, it is a good place to be when you cry out to the Lord for deliverance. And God doesn't only deliver you when you first are saved, when you first come to know Jesus. There are going to be frequent prayers of deliverance as you walk with Jesus. And I will tell you this morning, and, and I want you to know this, that God's deliverance is always based on his character and never on your circumstances. And that is a difficult place to be. When you realize that God could deliver, but his timing is different than yours. The way he delivers is different than yours. And it is always based upon his character and never your circumstances, meaning God somehow, some way is going to get glorified out of this. Though you may not see it, though you're limited in perspective, God's character is on the line. And there's three things I think about as we, as we look at this. Number one, there's God's protection. Number two, there is God's reputation. And number three, there is God's mercy. And we'll go back over those real quick. But look at verse 21. Let's read this. So he says here in verse 21, But you, O Lord God, deal kindly with me for your name's sake. Your loving kindness is good. Deliver me, for I am afflicted and needy, and my heart is wounded within me. I am passing like a shadow when it lengthens. I am shaken off like the locust, which is interesting, like a, a dead locust on a piece of fabric. You just kind of flick it off. Right? You ever felt like that? Like you can say to your friends later today, I feel like a locust flicking off. And you're like... Okay, that's interesting. All right, here we go. Verse 24, my knees are weak from fasting. My flesh has grown lean without fatness. I have also become a reproach among them. And when they see me, they wag their heads. Help me, O Lord, my God. Save me according to your loving kindness. Notice how the continual default is on God's character. Don't deliver me because it's going to make me feel good. Don't deliver me because you know how awkward this is. He's saying, deliver me because of your love, your commitment. Notice how he says, and let them know that this is your hand. Let them know that you have done this. Verse 28, let them curse, but you bless. When they arise, they shall be ashamed and your servant will be glad. Let my accusers be clothed with dishonor and let them cover themselves with their own shame as with a robe. See, these, four, these three things, are, they jump out at me. First, God's protection. If God loves you, he will protect you. As any shepherd with a, with a flock of sheep is determined to protect his sheep from the, from the adversaries, from the enemies, so sure you need to believe if he has saved your souls from eternal damnation, he is sure to save your souls for, uh, for future coronation and glory with Jesus. He will never leave you or forsake you. As sure as you are in the Son's hands and the Son is in the Father's hands, so much as you have this double security in Christ that you will never be lost by God. He will protect you. John 10, that was what I just referenced. Romans 8, right? If, if God is for you, who can be against you? And you need to know with certainty today that he will keep you. Nothing shall separate you from the love of God in Jesus Christ, neither height nor depth, nor heaven nor hell, nor angels nor principalities, nor things present nor things to come. It doesn't matter. Fill in the blank. Put every word you want in there. God's got you. He will not lose you because his glory is on the line. 
Secondly, God's reputation. His reputation is like David saying, save me so that you will be known as a God who is on the side of the righteous and against the evildoers. Like, deliver me so that the message I've been trying to share is, is a message that's right in line with your heart, God. Your glory, God. What's amazing is that David is not concerned about his reputation. He's concerned about God's. Never get the two confused. Can I just say something maybe mom, dad never said to you? This is not about you. We live in such a self-absorbed, self-obsessed culture, and we think the world revolves around us. Hello? It doesn't. This is not about you. Everything that is taking place moment by moment, minute by minute, day by day, all has to do with the glory of God. This has nothing to do with you. And the moment you are taken off the throne and God is placed right there at the center of it all, boy, you begin to have perspective like you've never had before. Can I tell you, I, I know what this is like. 2000, year 2000, how long ago was that? Let's see, two, 19, separate, carry the seven. Yeah, 19 years ago. So 19 years ago. I don't, I don't do math well. I don't even read the book of numbers in the Bible. I just, I, to, I tore it out. I, that's a bad dad pastor joke. I'm sorry. 2000, I planted a church. We didn't have kids. It became our baby. Invested blood, sweat, and tears into this. Saw God work. Saw God bring people to Jesus. Saw relationships healed. Marriages healed. Families healed. God was growing a, a, a wonderful church. And, and yet, there came a point when friends that I was ministering alongside of turned to me and said hurtful things to me, said slanderous things about me. And I'm sitting there going, you know, it's almost like a Twilight Zone episode. You're like, what's going on? How, how do I even make sense of this? Like, I'm meeting with mentors. Like, can you speak into my life? Because am I not seeing something that I should be seeing? And eventually these friends said, we want you to leave. Everything you've invested your life into, just go ahead and take off eight years into it. And boy, I had, I had two pastors in my life outside of this context where one pastor said, fight it. Fight them, fight for the church. And, and part of me was like, yeah. And then another pastor on the other side saying, Scott, it's not your church. It's Jesus' church. Do you want to continue to push this thing uphill? Or are you going to do the crazy, uncultural thing to do, and that is submit to those leaders you put into place and walk away from it? Part of me wanted to fight, right? Get my claw marks all over that sucker, right? But part of me, like the Spirit showed me, do I want to be that guy that had the reputation of fighting for the church and seeing all the fallout that came with the fighting and led his family with as little energy as they had left through this battle. And in the end, come out what? what? Victorious? To, yeah, stress out. To what end? Or do I heed the counsel of a, a mentor who said, this has nothing to do with you. This is, this is Jesus' church. And for some reason, there was that verse that said, and God will build his church and the gates of hell will not stand against it. Whew. So I did the uncultural thing and walked away. I determined to take the high road to be the better person. But boy, I wish on that I could have just walked away, right? And been like, okay, what's next? But then there comes all the little ramblings that go on out there, right? After you leave, people, because it's such a stupid thing, right, to ask me to leave, then all the rumblings come in because people aren't happy with just ambiguity. We've got to make this a little bit more um, TMZ-ish. Well, you know, Pastor Scott, he was, he was really addicted to porn. And my wife knows, you know Lori, she is mama bear, right? Oh, when we heard that, my wife was ready to, 
she, she had her Holy Spirit machine gun ready to go. You guys, you guys ever, have, you ever have that in your artillery? Like, okay, here we go, Lord. <laughs> you know, right? um, and, you know, again, it was one of those things where I had to calm her heart because I said, if you, if, you can't, if you don't silence that critic, or you do, what about that critic over there? And what about that person? And all of a sudden, your life is daily consumed about what people are saying about you and you trying to control what's being said about you versus, and here's the lesson, you let your character silence your critics. Again, if God's reputation is on the line and you're his kid, here is the only rule uh, uh, of safety I know of, and that is just walk with Jesus and honor him. Because here's what will happen, is your character will shout louder than the lies and slander and gossip from your critics. I'm not up here speaking as if, hey, I just read 10 books on this topic and here's what I learned. I'm one who's come through with bruises and scratches and scars and blood and a story and a smile that says, do it. It will be hard as hell, but you will never taste heaven so gloriously. Can I say that again? It will be hard as hell, but you will never taste heaven so gloriously. This is about the Lord. This is not about you. You will come and go, but the Lord's name will reign forever. Somehow, even this will be swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your sting? Sin, where is your sting? Which now gives a chance for God's mercy to show up. Number three. Notice what David says. Lord, right, verse, verse 26, right, Help me, Lord. Save me. Let them know this is about you. Right? There's his reputation, right? Let, this, let them know that your hand is on this, that you have done it. Because here's the context. I am a mess. I am broken. I am needy. I am hurting. And I am crippled. And my knees can't take it anymore. And I feel like that dead bug on the cloth that's just being flung off. But God's mercy is so good in showing up and giving you what you know you don't deserve, but you are so delighted to take it. Right? God's mercy, his hand of mercy on you. What a testimony to his goodness and his loving kindness. Let me, let me show you Peter. So if, if you don't believe Romans 12, perhaps you'll believe Peter. If you don't hear from Paul, hopefully you'll hear from Peter. All right? Peter chapter, 1 Peter chapter 2 and chapter 3. Again, meditation this week. Notice what, what Peter says here. Here's, I'm going to give you some application. This is a gracious thing. This is a grace-filled thing. When, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. Let me stop right there. If you're suffering because you've been a dork, it's on you. Okay? If you've just been acting like a jackwad, it is on you. But when you suffer for doing what's right and good and honorable to the Lord, what credit is there if when you sin, you're beaten for it, right? You, you deserve it. But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a grace-filled thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called. This is the calling on your life as one who's in Christ. Christ, he gave an example because he suffered for you, leaving an example that you might follow in his steps. It gets better. Notice this. He committed no sin. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who always judges justly. Let me tell you something. Point number one, side notes, write these down. You have to learn to commit your cause to God. He knows, he's aware, he's paying attention. If this is about his glory and this is about your good, all I know at the end of the day, the only safe rule is to commit your cause to him. You cannot fight your battles. You need to let him fight it. 
Remember what I said earlier, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. Don't you try to avenge yourself. Don't you try to attempt it. Don't you try to get even because if you do, I'm going to tell you right now, it's going to make matters worse. Number two, after you commit your cause to God, God, remember God is involved in the trials of his people. God is involved in what happens to his kids. Any loving parent, parent you know what, you start messing with my kids, you're getting Papa Bear and Mama, Mama Bear involved. Right? You need to realize that God cares for you and he, was, he has promised to never let anything befall you that would be for your destruction. So you need to connect to his heart, right? So you need to remember he's involved in your trials. Number three, you need to keep your conscience clear. Because while you may put on a good facade for everybody else, God knows where your heart's at and you need to keep your conscience clear. First Peter chapter three, next chapter, look what uh, Peter writes. Now there is, uh, there's two, um, now who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ as Lord is holy, right? Stay connected to him and always be prepared to make a defense of anyone who asks you for a reason of the hope that's in you. And now it gets really good. Do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Remember back early on about two hours ago, I said surprising and shaming them? said two hours ago. It feels like two hours ago. No, it doesn't. Okay, good. For it is better to suffer for doing good if that should be God's will than for doing evil. Isn't it great that the word of God's not silent on these things? Like, I mean, right there, Romans 12, 1 Peter chapter 2 and 3, that is enough this week for you guys. Keep your conscience clear. Boy, the thing that allowed me to sleep and, and trust the sovereignty of God when I'm going through these dark seasons is the fact that God knows me he knows my heart and when you're going through those seasons you ransack your soul and you come before the lord and say god show me where i'm wrong show me where i'm sinning and if you've exposed your heart to him and you've allowed his light to shine on you and there's nothing that becomes apparent sleep soundly despite what's being said about you and number four you need to find an encourager to walk with you during these difficult seasons. Don't we need somebody to be like, can you just speak into my life? Like, I'm not asking you to be a yes man, but just be somebody that says, can you keep me in check? Because if you don't check yourself, you'll wreck yourself. You know what I'm saying? All right. Check yourself. I love in history, baseball, a player named Jackie Robinson. Jackie played for the Brooklyn Dodgers Broke the color barrier in baseball. Probably one of the greatest e e events in sports history, right? Jackie would come on the field and he would continually be just inundated with slurs and insults. And there's one instance in a game, particularly in Cincinnati, where Jackie took the field, and we're talking about an amazing baseball player. Jackie took the field and, and the audience is just hounding him calling him all sorts of horrible things. Pee Wee Reese, now there's a good name for a baseball player, right? Pee Wee Reese walks over to Jackie Robinson, puts his arm around him and looks at the audience and everything just quiets down. Like, if you're going to make fun of my black brother, you're going to make fun of me, your white brother. And don't, there's no room for this. So he silenced the critics, but that wasn't the, that wasn't the end of the journey. Here's what made the story of Jackie Robinson so remarkable. There was the owner of the Brooklyn Dodgers whose name was Branch Rickey, another great name. Branch loved Jesus. Jackie also loved Jesus. This white owner and this black player came together and said, if this battle is to be won, and here's what Branch said to Jackie, it will be won through non-retaliation. They committed themselves to a Bible study every single week together, encouraged each other in Christ, were reminded of the Spirit of Jesus, and were determined to be the men who said, we will not fight fire with fire, but we will embody the Spirit of Christ. And guess what happened? The barrier was broken. Don't we need people like Branch Ricky in our lives? Yeah. Right? People who are going to walk with us and encourage us and keep 
the thing, the, the, the main thing, the main thing. As we endure slander, as we endure our critics. Which brings us to the last point, the cry of praise, right? We, we have this psalm, this imprecatory psalm, and, and look how the psalmist ends, and I love the, the confidence. He says in verse 30, with my mouth I will give thanks abundantly to the Lord. All I know is when you're going through dark seasons, it is not the time to stop being thankful. If you stop thankfulness, you will breed discontentment. You will breed bitterness. You will breed frustration. Thankfulness is like the roundup to the weeds of bitterness that are trying to grow in your heart. Spray it, baby. Kill it. The most, most, the most unsatisfied people in the world are the most ungrateful people. Here the psalmist says in verse 30, I'm going to let my gratitude pour forth abundantly. He says, with my mouth, I will give thanks abundantly to the Lord. In the midst of of many, I'm going to praise you. In the midst of my enemies, I'm going to praise you. In the midst of my family, I'm going to praise you. For, look at this, he stands at the right hand of the needy to save him from those who judge his soul. Here's what the psalmist is telling us today and why we can walk away with confidence in our lives for whatever's going to face us. Write down two words in your notes. The first word is accuser. The second word is advocate. Though you will have an accuser or accusers, if you have Christ, You have an advocate who is more powerful than any accuser that may come along. If God is for us, who can be against us, right? But the reason why accuser is such an important word is because the psalmist uses it a few times in Psalm 109. You know what the the word for accuser is? Satan. Okay, now we're getting a little bit better picture here. Because here's what we need to be reminded of, because Satan is the accuser. And he infuses his characteristics of accusing in the lives of people who are unwittingly used as his pawns. Which brings me to Ephesians chapter 6. Ladies and gentlemen, remember this please, that when you face your enemy, your enemy who you see with your eyes is not your real enemy who you can't see with your physical eyes, because... There is a spiritual battle raging out there where the accuser, Satan, is, is, is rampant. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle, we do not fight against flesh and blood. This is not about what is tactile and tangible and touchable. This is about the rulers, the authorities, the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces in the heavenly places. There is a war going on that we cannot see with our physical eyes. That every inch of the universe is claimed by Christ and counterclaimed by Satan. And perhaps there's no greater area of that than the battleground of our heart. And there are people who don't know Jesus who are, like I said, unwittingly used as pawns in the accuser's service. Here's what you need to understand. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. And like I said, if God is for you, who can be against you? Because while we may have an accuser, if you have Jesus, you have much more an advocate. Write down Zechariah chapter 3. Old Testament, I know, this is risky, recommending Old Testament passages to you guys. Zechariah 3, he showed me Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord has chosen Jerusalem to rebuke you. Is not this brand plucked from a fire? Because Joshua was standing before the Lord clothed with filthy garments. But the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And he said to him, behold, I have taken your iniquity away and you are now clothed with pure vestments. And I said, let them put on a clean turban on his head. And they put a clean turban on his head and clothed them with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. 
what you have is you have an Old Testament picture of what Christ has done for everyone who believes in him, who trusts him, who turns to him. That the, the fact that you are a child of his and he has acted as your advocate may not silence your accusers, but I'm going to tell you right now, this is where you learn to dial down their voices and dial up his. Listen to the voice of your advocate and stop listening to the voice, voices of your critics. David says, they may use their mouths to curse me. I am going to use my mouth to extol and bless you, O God. Right? Like, don't play their game. Be different. And maybe somehow, some way, their hearts will be broken. And if not, God is sure to take care of them. Be the man and woman God wants you to be. Realize that it is God who stands at our right, uh, we stand at his right hand, and, he, and we are the needy and we are the poor. And God will make our cause known. He will know a thousand ways to work all out situations without violence, without retribution, without destruction. He is going to bring the truth to life. And all I know is that his truth will go marching on and his glory will be displayed forever. And you don't need to worry about it. Walk with him, please. Love him. And let your character be that of Jesus. And God will reward you for living like that. Amen. Not an easy, easy topic. Not an easy passage. First service, I can tell you right now, they weren't ready for it. Pray for the first service people. Yeah, <laughs> they need it. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you guys. Love you. Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thanks for today. Thank you for helping us navigate this, this passage and to, to hopefully understand your heart. As difficult as the, the text may be, I believe the, the spirit of, of who you want us to be has, has been made clear. Lord, uh, the path is, is laid out in front of us. And, and I pray that you would forgive us for the ways we've tried to manage these things in our lives. Uh, because we have felt the fact that these, it doesn't work. We, we want to surrender to you. We want to trust you. We want to know that and be reminded of is that you, you've got this. And this is not new to you. you. You're the God who brought everything from nothing. And you're the God who's dealt with far worse critics than we could perhaps face in our lives. And that, Lord, Lord our, our, my prayer for myself and my brothers and sisters here is this, that we would just abide in Jesus and allow the Spirit of Jesus to, without end, just flow through us. And that is only by your strength and that is only by your wisdom. So we are dependent upon you, Father. Be glorified in all things. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and be so gracious and good to you. Have a great week, you guys. Love you. Bye-bye.